Hello, everybody. My name is Sarah Souther, and I am a professor of plant ecology and conservation at Northern Arizona University. I am here today to talk about the Emory Oak Collaborative Tribal Restoration Initiative, um, which is a collaboration between Western Apache tribes, the Forest Service, and industry. I'll talk more about the partners in just a second. But I'm here presenting on behalf of my colleague, Nanaba Linden, at the Forest Service. She's on the Kaibab National Forest as the tribal liaison. And of course, Mr. Vincent Randall, who's the cultural director for the Yavapai Apache Nation. Just to kind of more fully describe our partners, we are partnered with the four Western Apache tribes, the San Carlos Apache tribe, Tonto Apache tribe, White Mountain Apache tribe, Yavapai Apache nation, <laughs> and of course the Forest Service. Um, Emory Oaks right now, our treatment stands occur on the Coconino and Tonto National Forests. And then our primary funding partner has been Resolution Copper, but we're starting to branch out and we have other parties that are also funding this work, including Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation and the Salt River Project. In addition, we are starting to receive research funding from the National Science Foundation, as well as NOAA. So hopefully everyone has had the opportunity to watch the Emory Oak Collaborative Tribal Restoration Initiative video, but I just wanted to re-emphasize the importance of Emory Oaks and their acorns to the Western Apache people. This is a slide I've gotten from um, Dee Randall, who is an ex, a retired uh, forester for the San Carlos Apache tribe. And what this slide is showing is that um, the Apache people basically define their homeland based on the presence of emery oak. So acorns still feature um, in most Apache ceremonies. If you go to a major event, you'll have acorn stew and it's delicious and wonderful and just a really important expression of their culture and traditional food. So the Emory Oak Restoration Project, our goal is to ensure the long-term persistence of Emory Oak, as well as all of the traditions surrounding Emory Oak. So one thing, this project emerged completely out of concerns of tribal elders who had noticed that Emory Oak stands were producing fewer acorns um, and also recruiting fewer new seedlings to the populations that they had harvested from for years and years. So they started to kind of bring awareness um, of this issue to the Forest Service, particularly since something like 70% of emery oak acorn or emery oak trees uh, occur on US um, Forest Service lands. So finally, we were able to kind of coalesce this project with the support and funding of Resolution Copper and um, it, we're really kind of taking off, but everything is centered really in this tribal perspective. So we have a couple of guidelines um, and, and objectives that we're trying to accomplish. We are of course trying to restore and protect emery oak groves, but we're also interested in the other culturally important plants within those systems. Um, so a lot of indigenous tribes use a suite of, of different plants at these sites. And so it's really important for us to think holistically about these ecosystems and about their conservation. We want to learn about emery oak um, and restoration and management in general. So this is a relatively understudied system. And so it's important for us to kind of understand foundationally what are the functions and dynamics that are important to maintaining healthy emery oak systems. We want to incorporate traditional ecological knowledge into all of our research efforts, our treatments, and our decision making. This is really important to us to have hold central the tribal opinions and their values, as well as their concerns. We want to reconnect tribal communities to ancestral lands because, because of course, you know, this this is the property 
um, and our, the current reservations represent such a small fraction of the the homeland of our indigenous people here in the United States. We also want to influence land management practices for broader impact. So we're trying to write up our findings and think about range-wide conservation of the, of the species. So that's part of the role of the research team, which I am a part of. We are constantly trying to publish and think about how we can get this information out to other land managers, um, particularly kind of in the southern part of the state, we're reaching out to folks on the Coronado now. And then of course we want to kind of go down and um, hopefully think about talking to land managers in Mexico as well, um, eventually. And then we want to support tribal training, employment, capacity building and youth education. Because we are working with a species whose importance comes from the harvest, it's really important for us to not only conserve the tree species, but also the interactions with those tree species. This includes protecting access to make sure tribal members can have access to these sites to be able to practice harvest, but it also means providing opportunities for elders to pass on harvest traditions to youth. So this is an important part of the resilience of this Emory Oak system. We have, again, this just is reiterating the fact that we have a strong focus on tribal values and that is at the center of our project. We are overseen by the Chichil Advisory Board um, this is comprised of elders from all four participating tribes, and they oversee all of our decision making for this project. Here's just a little slide showing some of the um, tri tribal advisory board. We we engage with the tribal advisory board regularly, so we hold quarterly meetings. Um, we're always available to talk. Everything though, all of the decisions about the restorations, about where to put things, about what's published, what's talked about, all of this goes through the tribal advisory board. So they are central in advising us as to future directions and how we manage the projects. Tribal input is um, integrated throughout the project. So when we are collecting scientific data, we can take that and ask for interpretation to our tribal advisory board, we can have them make recommendations, we can have them help think through the whole process. So their thoughts and opinions are, are integrated throughout this project. So to get back to what exactly we're doing, just to give kind of a overall context for this project, um, I wanted to address the fact that this entire, entire project evolved out of elder observations that there were few emery oak seedlings. And they they say the trees are getting old and there are no young trees to replace the old trees. So I'm, I know I'm talking to a bunch of foresters who will know all of this, but some of the reasons why we might not be seeing as many new seedlings today are of course the fire suppression um, policies that we enacted over much of the 20th century. This has led to an accumulation of fuels within our emery oak stands. And this does a couple of things. One, it increases competition for water resources, but it also increases the likelihood of catastrophic wild, stand replacing wildfires. Um, European settlers also introduce livestock. They trample and consume juvenile emery oak plants. Um, and they also, degrade the perennial grass layer, um, which is important for one, maintaining a healthy fire system, fire regime within these populations, because, you know, fine fuels ignite easily and then carry the fire um, distances, fire distances. And so that is kind of the healthy fire regime for these oak systems. They, we believe that they were adapted to frequent but low intensity fires. And so the grasses are important in that fire regime. But um, they also, there's evidence that um, these grasses kind of help with recruitment of emery oak seedlings, that grasses and emery oaks don't really compete for water resources over a large part of, 
the emery oak's life. And so it's easier for seedlings to recruit with a grass understory as compared to these really dense shrub systems, which are constantly kind of competing over the life cycle of an emery oak for water resources. We've also diverted a lot of water to agriculture and cities in this region. So this is dropping our water tables. Um, and this is a concern that this, this kind of drying out has been negative, negatively impacting the emery oak populations. And finally, all of these things are occurring in the context of changing climates, which just serves to exacerbate things like wildfire incidences and the effects of drought in this region. As an ecologist, what we're concerned about is that all of these accumulating stressors will provide the opportunity for an ecological state change in which the Emory Oak system itself converts to another system like a chaparral or other, or other type of um, ecological system or community composition. And the fear is that these stressors mount and then there's a disturbance event and that just creates this wholesale change in the species composition. And then after the state changes occurred, it's very hard to recover that state. This is a classic ball and cup model that we always use to talk about state changes. Um, many people may have seen this in an ecology class along the way. But essentially what this is showing is you, the little ball indicates an emery oak state in this case, what we're talking about. And as you have these accumulating stressors, the system is considered less resilient. So the resiliency of the system is measured by the depth of that well. And resilience just means how much disturbance can a system take and recover its essential function and characteristic. So you have all of these accumulating stressors and then something happens like a drought and it pushes that system into a novel state. The other concept here is that once we've transitioned to another state, it's hard to recover. So it's really difficult to get the state to go back to its original form. And that's why we're trying to take these, these um, precautions now. And we want to enact these treatments now, considering that we can control certain things like the density of these stands, but we can't control the climate at this point. So what our goal is, is to create really resilient emery oak stands. Now, when we set restoration targets, we um, are looking, we're typically looking at a, time, a, a place in time that's happened long ago. So we're thinking about, in this case, pre-colonization times. And of course, this is all information that's being kind of pieced together um, from various sources. There's some important work being done um, by D. Randall, um, looking at old pictures and trying to piece together historic densities within these stands. But what we do know is that there were less trees in these stands, they were less dense in the past, they had these a very frequent low intensity fire um, regime. And of course there weren't things like cattle. So we know all of these things. And we also know that these are issues um, and factors in reducing recruitment in these stands. So kind of at the heart of this restoration project, just to make it more tangible, I wanna go through a couple of these different methods and treatments that we're thinking about implying, but the kind of core of it is really a fuels reduction treatment. So we're thinning these stands and particularly getting rid of competing vegetation like junipers and other chaparral species that have popped up in these systems. We also would like to imp employ prescribed burns um, to again reintroduce a healthy fire regime. We are considering excluding livestock We're also considering um, protecting acorns or directly planting acorns. Now this is only going to occur at Emory Oak sites. And there's an important reason for this that was driven by the elder advisory committee. They expressed to us concern that we could not move the Emory Oaks out of their current distribution because they, be they believe that the creator put the trees where they're supposed to be and that we shouldn't be messing with the location of the trees. 
the concept of restoration is okay, that we can kind of return this to a more healthy state, but we're not supposed to be moving things around on the landscape. That said, a certain amount of predator exclusion may be necessary. So everything in our woodlands wants to eat acorns, <laughs> as the hunters in the room will know. Um, and so while an emery oak tree produces something like 15,000 acorns on average in a given year, 99% of those acorns are consumed by vertebrates, even more by invertebrates. There are little beetles that infest the um, acorns. And then those acorns that are left that haven't been consumed by either vertebrates or invertebrates then have to find a favorable microsite and experience favorable weather conditions for establishment. So by the time we work our way down all of these requirements, we actually find in many years that we don't see any recruitment in emery oak stands. It's highly variable through time. And so there could be a need if we're not getting recruitment to actually kind of assist the process. And finally, we've considered um, restoration of the other, of the other um, plants within these ecosystems, particularly grasses. Like I mentioned before, grasses are important to the fire regime. And we also think that they play an important role in seedling recruitment um, of emery oaks. So, as I mentioned before, I'm on the research team for the Emory Oak project. And our job really is to look at the restoration treatments and see, hey, are these restoration treatments having the effect that we want them to have? Um, are they improving outcomes? Are they increasing the viability of these Emory Oaks? Increasing, of course, recruitment and like persistence of those new recruits. We are looking at questions of scale. How much of a system do we need to treat in order to see, in order to see benefits? Do we need to be treating at the watershed scale, or can we treat these smaller little emery oak stands? We are looking at what combinations of techniques really lead to um, restoration outcomes that we want. We want to look at whether what other factors predict when treatment outcomes are positive. You know, are we seeing the biggest benefit at sites with high amounts of precipitation or something along those lines? And then we're, we're also helping to kind of look at the ecology of the species and saying, hey, where do we need to treat and how do we prioritize the stands? Because as everyone knows, there's a limited amount of funding and time to do to do all of this stuff. So all of this is kind of wrapped up in our adaptive management model for how we are looking at um, the efficacy of these research, of, of these treatments. And I should say again, one important component of this too is the export of this knowledge to other regions so that other places within the entire range of embryo can implement treatments as well. So to look at the effects of our restoration treatments, we set up nine plots at a minimum at these sites. The concept here is that we can have three control plots and we can have kind of two uh, different treatments. So we can have a, like all thinning treatment and then we can have a thinning plus burn treatment. So we can layer on these, these um, treatments. We'd love to have more plots, but a lot of these emery oak stands are kind of small in the, in the area of the state that we're working in. So we can usually only fit this many kind of independent plots in. We are collecting pre-treatment data and then post-treatment data. And then we can analyze this data using a uh, Baki design before after control impact, which is important because that lets us tease out the effects of our of our treatments um, from kind of inter-annual variation in performance. We collect a ton of data at these groves. Um, you know, at the heart of it is a kind of typical stand survey where we're looking at you know, taking DRC measurements within these plots of all of the trees, but we also collect additional information on the emery oaks. So we tag the emery oaks, we follow them individ individually each year, and we're looking at survival, growth, um, or taking information on acorn counts. We are looking at things like pests and pathogens and their occurrence on the trees, uh, noting herbivory, looking for drought stress, all of these things that we think might be important for understanding the dynamics of these populations we're noting. 
This is also important data because we can contextualize our restoration efforts in terms of population growth rate and viability. So we can actually look and say, hey, are we meeting our goals? Are these populations sustainable? Or are we doing all of this? And they're doing better, but it's not on on the level that we need it to be. In other words, the populations aren't replacing themselves and we cannot predict that they'll be there in you know, several hundred years. We're also looking at the composition of the stand themselves and the understory and other um, components of those systems, in part because some of those are traditional use plants, we want to track them, and in part because we think that that might play a role in how effective our treatments are. This is just an overview of where our current treatment areas are. Um, we have 13 sites. One is on a private ranch in the southern part of the state. Two are on the Tonto National Forest. Um, let's see, how many are left? I think three are on the White Mountain Apache Tribal Nation lands. And then the remaining populations are on the Coconino, the Red Rock District. So you can see, as of right now, we're kind of concentrating in the northern part of Emory, Emory Oaks Range, but I'm hoping to expand some of our studies farther south in the next couple of years. So these two, Cracker Jack and Sparky, have received thinning treatments already. And um, that just occurred last year, I believe. So this is our first year of post-treatment data. So we're still getting those in. Um, our, we have a tribal monitor crew of tribal monitors that go out and collect our data. So we are trying to integrate tribal capacity building in all of these ways. And they can also use their kind of insights when they're looking at these stands and, and give us their impressions and their thoughts. So they are conducting the stand surveys. We're still entering those data and hopefully I'll have some results for everyone soon. But I just wanted to say that there are some kind of emergent concerns. And this is one that I wanted to point out. And one thing that we're really hoping that our treatments can address. We've been seeing increasing levels of drought in this region. And we experienced during that 2020, 2021 drought, high, high, high oak mortality, particularly in the Southern part of the state in conjunction with um, charcoal canker. So this is something to keep your eye out for when you're going around. Um, it has this, this really kind of um, charcoal-y like appearance, though when it's younger, it can be kind of a lighter shade. And it is something that we're starting a new research project looking at. We're going to look at these disease dynamics and their coincidence with, more, with mortality of emery oak and with drought. So that is something that is coming up, but it's also something to keep your eye out for if you're managing properties with oak populations. And with that, I'd just like to say thank you. Um, since I'm not there in person, please feel free to email me with any questions that you might have. I really appreciate your time and sorry I couldn't be there in person. Bye.